Right. Now, your rescuers were your heroes. Well, before that, I just want to say oh, one sure. thing. That when I landed on that uh, farm, that was a World War I air base. Oh, was it? And the air, airmen that flew out of the uh, World War I base at that time was uh, France's number one, um, had 53 victories of uh, German planes in the 54th mission he got shot down. Oh. He never got back. But our number one ace was Rickenback. I had only 27. Oh, so, so it was double. So we honor Rickenback. Can you sure. imagine what happened? And I that know. just happened to be a perfect place for an air base. Then uh, I was uh, laying out in the living room floor uh, for several days. And, and, and you actually have brought a picture of a reenactment of right. you laying yeah, on, the, on the living room floor. But what happened is a, uh, German, the German army brought a doctor over, the Gestapo brought a doctor over, and he wanted to amputate my, hand, my arm, and I wouldn't let him do it. He uh, insisted for two days that, to uh, amputate, and I wouldn't let him do it, so they left me there. He poured some white powder on me, I think it was sulfur, and uh, poured it on my head and my arms, my legs, and so forth. Everywhere I was wounded, uh, and I think that helped me quite a bit, but uh, he left in disgust, and uh, I think they left me there to die. But they put two guards over me, and they never took me out of the farmhouse. And I stayed there for four, five, six days, I don't know how long it was. I gave myself the last rites, I thought I was ready to go, when all of a sudden, uh, three men walked in with pistols. I look up and I thought there was a Gestapo coming to threaten me for more information because I never gave them any information except my name, rank, serial number. Right. And they, they were very angry at me. But the next thing I know, two of them walked in the back room and I hear pop, pop. And the other fella came over to me and put his finger to his mouth. To, to silence you. That's Don't, right. Yeah. They picked me up, they put me in the car, and I knew that I was with the French resistance. So three fellas, René, Félix, Jean Jolie, and Pierre de Marchais, I owe my life to them. God bless them. They're, that's why I wrote the book on honoring them. But anyway, they, they put me in the, one of their cars and off they went and we met up with the German patrol and we had a big firefight. While we were having a firefight, I got hit right in, right in the side here. You got shot again. Again, yeah. Say it. You yeah, got shot right, again. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not laughing, but I can't imagine what you've gone through. Well, that's right. So now they drove me to a, a champagne factory to hide me. And they brought me down about 500 feet and I'm down there with a 30 watt bow plane on the cold ground, and the reason I'm there is that we just killed several Germans, and they were out looking for us. Sure. And then when it came dark, they brought me to a farm. They took me out, brought me to a farmhouse, and it happened to be the farmhouse of one of my rescuers, Rene Felix. And uh, I was in such pain, I was moaning and groaning, and uh, they sent for a, an English-speaking teacher. The name was Madame Ramoche. And she came in and told me that I have to keep quiet because the Germans were bivouac next door. And if you don't keep quiet, we're going to have to turn you over to the Germans. So I said, get a piece of cloth, tie it around my mouth, and I'll bite in it all night and tie it around my neck. And all night long, I bit on that cloth, stopped the morning. And next morning, the, she came back and she said, I think we've got somebody that can take care of you. We're going to take you to a clinic. So they put me on a, <clears throat> on a horse and buggy. This fellow named Polo was a driver. He was a local taxi man. They had no cars, they had no gasoline, so they had the horse and buggy, and they took me down to a clinic right behind the Reims Cathedral in Reims, France. Yes. And uh, I might have a picture of that too, by the way. Uh, anyway, the, uh, they got a hold of a doctor who I didn't know was Jew a Jew doctor, mm -hmm. who owned the clinic and was living in a cellar. I didn't know about this until years later. And he was living there hiding from... He was hiding from the Gestapo. From the Gestapo. They got caught him off, he'd go uh, to a concentration camp. Absolutely. So what happened is that uh, they, they operated on me, and every time they operated on me, I'd come, I'd come to because of lack of anesthesia. So they had to perform three operations. They did that in, in two days. Uh, the second day that he operated, he told the... Uh, the French uh, resistance that he had to amputate my, my arm. The French resistance knew that I want my arm amputated, so they put a gun to his head. And they said, no, you've got to save this man, save his arm. And he said, I have to operate again the next day. 
I, I spent three miserable days in that, that, that clinic with pain, no pain, medication, uh, coming to in the middle of an operation. Oh my. But I gotta thank that doctor for saving my arm, my life, and the three resistance workers. Imagine. Now, I haven't had anything to eat for several days. Right. I haven't had anything to drink. The only drink they gave me was a beer, and I needed water, so I, so I rang the bell to get some, some water. And when I rang the bell, the nurse ran in with two men, and she said, quick, we have to dress you up. Vit, 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 quick. I didn't know what had happened. So I heard him talking back and forth. I understood him to say that one of the nurses was a collaborator of the, of the Germans and was giving me away, and they had to get me out of the hospital. So they took me downstairs, dressed me up in my Air Force clothes, put me downstairs in a gutter. Uh, actually, on the sidewalk, I slipped into the gutter. I'm laying in the gutter, it was a Saturday afternoon, and all I could see was German soldiers walking by with their dates, and they yeah, probably they thought I was a drunk. In, they put you in a town in the gutter. <laughs> yeah, well, they put me on the sidewalk. They, right. didn't, they didn't want to get caught. Right. See? And when they did that, I, I happened to slip in a gutter, and apparently the German soldiers thought I was uh, a drunk, so they didn't pay any attention to me. And shortly, a, a young man came over with a date, and he picked me up. I figured he was going to try to help me, and took me to a place called the uh, circus. It was a, a, a World War I cavalry training center mm -hmm. in Reims, France, but they called it the circus. And they took me up a flight of stairs and kept pushing me up the stairs while I was trying to climb. After three operations, I'm climbing stairs. Right. <laughs> they put me into this room, and it was a... Uh, the room was like a jail room, and um, they had bars in the window, bars on the door. And when he left, he said to me in French, that don't open the, the door, don't try to open the door, don't look out the window. Uh, I couldn't even move out of the bed that they gave me. Right. And, uh, well, you know, John, yeah. um, we're going to ask you to hold that thought because we're going to do a two-part series uh, for this show because this story is just so amazing. So I would like to say, if you would join us for the continuing story that, of John Katsaris, that would be to your credit and to your benefit. I will tell you that um, this is Kathleen Corey Rami, joined by John Katsaris. Thanks on behalf of the crew for joining us on this first half of Call to Serve. Hi, welcome to Call to Serve. I'm your host, Kathleen Corey Rami. Today's special guest is John Katsaris, U.S. Army Air Force, World War II, flight engineer, aerial gunner, photographer, recipient of POW, Purple Heart, Air Medal with Cluster, Bronze Star, two presidential unit citations, European, African, Middle Eastern campaign, World War II victory medals, British flying boot, French resistance, and Caterpillar awards. And if that weren't enough, he is also a published author of the book, Code Burgundy, The Long Escape. And this is a very special show because it's in fact part two of a show because John was not able to tell about The Long Escape. And I would just like to mention that we left off. Welcome back to Call to Serve, John. Thank I you should very say much. that, excuse me. John um, uh, was telling us a wonderful story about the B 17 and bailing out at 20 kilometers from Reims, France, and landing uh, over um, this farm called the Bon Maison Farm. Now, John had endured uh, a terrible fi uh, firefight. He was injured, uh, lost several crewmen, and John, you had several pieces of shrapnel, you had a splintered right arm, and in fact, uh, during your uh, capture and, and eventual escape, people tried to amputate that arm. That's correct, because it caught uh, gangrene, and it was very uh, shattered pretty badly, and uh, both the uh, French doctor that operated on me saved my arm and life, and the German Gestapo doctor they both tried to amputate it, but uh, I would not allow them, and neither did the French Resistance. And the French Resistance ap actually held a gun to a Jewish doctor's head to tell them, don't you dare cut his arm That's off. That's correct. So, and let me just remind the audience that you endured days of operations without anesthesia or lack of uh, appropriate pain medicine and uh, running out of anesthesia. It, it, you've actually had a terrible ordeal. That's correct. 